My dear sisters, good evening. My name is Deacon Joe Menkaus. I'm a deacon here in the Diocese of Cleveland, Ohio, uh, which is obviously very much good friends with our sisters in the Mercedarian Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament, um, as they're over here on the west side of Cleveland. So it's so good to be with you this evening, um, especially as I'm told this is kind of a bonus talk for the discernment retreat that all of you have been able to participate in. Just to give you a little bit about myself, um, as I said, I am a deacon. I'm a transitional deacon. I've been in seminary for the last um, eight and a half years. Um, and along with my classmates, we are anticipating being ordained priests uh, this coming May for the Diocese of Cleveland. So please keep us in your prayers. Um, I am the oldest of eight siblings. Uh, there's four boys and four girls. I'm 26 years old and the youngest is 10. Now, um, I've been asked to speak a little bit on anxiety, but before we get to that, I just want to say a quick prayer to invite the Holy Spirit to be a part of this. So let's pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come Holy Spirit, we invite you into this place. We invite you to be a part of this talk. Father, I just ask that you bless uh, my sisters who are a part of this retreat. I ask that you Allow my words to be your words and allow their ears to hear only that which you desire for them to hear. We pray especially um, that through the intercession of the Blessed Mother, the Mother of the Eucharist, that hearts might be open, that hearts might be made pure, and that those who are called to pursue Jesus in a religious vocation might know so very clearly, very honestly, and very beautifully. We ask all this in your name. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Now, a quick disclaimer, I am not a psychologist by any stretch of the imagination. I barely made it through Intro to Psychology my first year of college. Um, but I am simply a brother who has dealt with anxiety. Um, along the way, I've learned some excellent tools to help deal with many of the effects of anxiety. And I simply desire to share the way that the Lord has worked in my life through the experience of anxiety. I totally understand that there are medical realities to anxiety that I really can't even speak to. But like Peter in the book of Acts, I simply wish to give what I've received. And what I've received is Jesus and the gifts of the Holy Spirit uh, by virtue of my baptism, my confirmation, and actually my diaconal ordination. So that's kind of my, my framework for this, this talk. My first experience with real anxiety was the summer before my internship year in the seminary. Um, our third year of college, or I'm sorry, of Theologate Seminary is an internship in the parish. And I was on a 30-day silent retreat, um, taking time away to pray with a lot of my formation, um, but also just receiving whatever God wanted to give me. While I was on that retreat, I had um, gotten to day 23 and things were, it was a tough retreat, but it was beautiful. On day 23, out of nowhere, my head started ringing like crazy. I started experiencing horrible tinnitus, what I later found out is called tinnitus. And in that experience, um, I was flooded with horrible, horrible anxiety. Um, just fear, terror, unable to eat, unable to pray, unable to sleep. It was all of the telltale signs of anxiety, but it was, it was terrifying for me because I had no idea what was going on. I'd never experienced anything like it, and it was just really, really intense. Um, a couple months ago, I was struck with COVID, and while I was in the COVID um, quarantine, I was going through the, the days of counting down so I could get out, till one day I started having trouble breathing and that drove me into a, a sort of anxiety. So between different health problems I've had, I've had to deal with it through that. Um, also in my vocational discernment, leading up particularly to my diaconate ordination. Um, throughout my discernment process as a seminarian, I really felt that God was calling me to be a priest. I really desired to be a priest. Um, but in the few weeks and months that led up to it, you could ask any of my classmates, I was a mess. I'm um, just wondering, like, Lord, is this really what you want me to do? Is this really the way you want me to use my life? And then immediately after ordination, um, beginning to hear the voice of the enemy saying, like, you have no idea what you've just done. Like, you have no idea that you just gave your life away and that that's forever and permanent. Um, not crazy anxiety, but just the sense of, like, 
all right, Lord, like I, I, I did what you asked me to do, but now I'm feeling crazy about it. Like, what do you, what do you want from me here? And then just discerning everyday decisions in life. Um, you know, second guessing myself and how I have assisted couples in marriage prep, how I correct other people around me, um, and how I relate to other people. Like, do I say the right thing? Do I experience, you know, do I share my experiences properly? And just learning how to be okay with the decisions that I make in my life. And so I want to frame all this within a key thought for the rest of this talk, that anxiety is mostly about what has happened in the past or what could happen in the future. Pretty rarely is anxiety related directly to where I am in this present moment and receiving this moment as a gift from God. It's usually worried, worries coming to us from something that happened in the past or something that will happen in the future. And so I want to turn to Scripture, to the Gospel of Matthew, um, to a very, very commonplace uh, passage that we hear all the time and that people quote all the time when they're dealing with anxiety. But I want to pull a couple things from it. So this is Matthew 6, 25 through 34. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And so there's two lessons from this passage that I want to pull that will give us some context for the rest of the talk. And the first is that we are given this command to seek God's kingdom and his righteousness. And we're told that when we seek the kingdom and his righteousness, these things will be given to us. Like, there's a promise there. He promises that when we seek his kingdom and his righteousness, he'll give them to us. And the second is that we are told, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will worry about itself. And I think this could be extended to, don't worry about what happened in the past. The past will worry about itself, will be taken care of in and of itself. So what is the consistent thought behind both of those teachings is that I was on retreat a couple months ago with the rest of the seminary, and we heard this talk from Father Scott Dedish, um, a priest of the Diocese of Erie, and he shared this quote with us that changed my life. He said, we need to see Christ in who we are and not in what could have been or could be. Say it again. We need to see Christ in who we are and not in what could have been or what could be. Basically, what Father Scott was pointing out was that we need to live in a spirituality of the present moment. We need to be focused on the moment, not on the past, not on the future, but on the present moment. There are so many voices in life that are constantly trying to steal us away from the voice of God the Father. The Father's voice is always telling us, you know, seek the kingdom and righteousness and you will receive and, and don't worry about today. You know, an example of this is focusing on the end goal of heaven, asking ourselves the question of, can I have the courage to realize that the bully that makes fun of me in school actually does not have any power over me? And that what really matters in the grand scheme of things and of all my story is the fact that I'm made, known, and loved by my father? On the other hand, the enemy is trying to make us worry about today by imagining what could happen in the future or recalling what has happened in the past because of what is happening in the present. You know, an example of this would be fearing making a, a discernment decision 
because we have seen someone mess up in their discernment or because maybe we see someone that isn't totally fulfilled in the discernment decision that they make. It's basing our, our current decisions or our current moments on stuff that other people have experienced in the past or maybe we've experienced in the past or that others have ex- will experience in the future or maybe we ourselves will experience in the future because of other people's experiences. So with all that said, we need to see Christ in who we are and not in what could have been or what could be. This thought of what could have been or could be is poisonous. And it only leads us into a place of despair and fear because Jesus is not in that moment. Jesus is in the present moment. He's in the now. He's in exactly where you are at this moment in your life. You might ask, how do we know that? Well, we could turn to Scripture, particularly to the story of Moses and the burning bush. In that, in that story, um, Moses is like going to God and saying, listen, you're asking me to fulfill this mission. You're asking me to do all this. When the people ask me, like, who told you to do this? What should I tell them? How will they know that I'm trustworthy? And so Moses says to God, if I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What do I tell them? And so God replies to Moses, I am who am. Then he added, this is what you will tell the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. So this is a really philosophical kind of deep sounding thought. But what it's coming down to is God, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, God simply is, meaning God is in the moment. So God is. He is the present. He is this place right now. So if God is in the moment, we need to place ourselves in the moment to deal with anxiety because most anxiety, as I said, comes from the past and the future. Well, how do we do that? I want to tell you there's five ways that I've found to be pretty effective. The first is prayer. Now, prayer can be really hard when you're feeling anxious, especially because you could be so worried about what's happening in the past or what will happen in the future. There's a couple of tricks that I've found that have helped me. Sometimes I like to take music, a book, a journal, stuff that helps me to get my mind outside of myself and my problems and my worries and my concerns and to just focus on Jesus. Another encouragement that I have with prayer is that even though you feel like you're wasting your time just feeling anxious in his presence, going and spending time in the presence of Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament is similar to going out and spending time in the sun, as if you're trying to get suntan. You can't help but be affected by the presence of God, especially if you're going with the intention of being present to him in his time and in his place. It's simply just letting the Holy Spirit work on our hearts through the presence of God. So first is prayer. Second, Catholic mindfulness. Now, there's a book written by Dr. Gregory Bataro called The Mindful Catholic. Um, it's an awesome book. I highly recommend it. I'm not going to get any money for telling you about it, but it's been extremely helpful for me. And basically, the, the gist of what it means to be a mindful Catholic is taking a few moments to ref- recall the fact that right here and right now, our only responsibility is to seek the kingdom of God and that everything else will be taken care of by our Father, just as the scripture said before. Um, Another key way to do this is just speaking truths over our lives, you know, telling ourselves, I am safe, I am loved, I am cared for, Jesus is for me, and he's with me. Um, Simply placing ourselves in the truths of our faith and of the love of the Father. A third way to deal with anxiety, to stay in the present moment, is staying in community. It's so important that we stay close to our good family and our good friends, the people that really build us up, the people that help us to be the best version of ourselves. You know, we're part of the body of Christ, and when we're separated from that body, none of us can exist on our own. Think of an arm that is separated from a body. The arm in and of itself has no power. It has no ability to act as an arm should or could. In that same way, you and I, when we're separated from the body of Christ, Um, especially if we've sinned maybe, Um, we need to be reunited with the body so that we can discern well, so that we can keep our head on straight, and so that we can stay within that present moment. A fourth way is taking care of ourselves, and this is just super practical. 
This is nourishing ourselves with the food that we know is going to keep us going, keep us moving throughout our daily lives. Um, sleeping enough, I know if I don't sleep enough, that morning I wake up exhausted, bad news bears. Like, I am definitely gonna be more anxious on that day than on another day. And then exercise. Um, a counselor that I've seen in the past that's helped me to learn some of the tools for anxiety, he wrote his whole doctorate on how 10 minutes a day of just even just brisk walking exercise can totally transform uh, the chemicals in our brain and help us to deal with anxiety inducing stuff in a much healthier way. And so number five, uh, rejecting thoughts that could take us out of the present moment. Um, there are so many voices I mentioned before, the voice of God, the voice of the enemy, and our own voice, the voice of others as well, that can try to distract us from uh, the good, the true, and the beautiful, the ways that God um, wishes to communicate with us. And especially when the enemy's voice comes in, this can be really hard to deal with. So when his voice, the enemy's voice, tells us that we will not be content, we can do things like rejecting the spirit of doubt, saying, in the name of Jesus, I reject the spirit of doubt. And then countering that uh, with claiming a spirit of goodness over our lives. So saying something like, in Jesus' name, I claim a spirit of peace over my life. Or when the enemy tells us we aren't good enough, we can reject that saying, in the name of Jesus, I reject the spirit of inadequacy. And then claiming the truth over our lives. In the name of Jesus, I proclaim the truth that I am good enough. That I don't have to be anything more than who God is calling me to be. And then with all of this, all the five, it's important to remember that God never allows us to be in situations that he doesn't give us the grace to handle. There's always an escape hatch available to us, always a way for us to sneak out the back door um, into the arms of mercy, of love, and grace to carry us through the moments of fear, worry, anxiety, and terror. And so, my sisters, I don't think I have to tell you twice, anxiety is a heavy cross to bear but one that I think opens up the heart to Jesus in such a unique and powerful way. It reminds us of our utter inadequacy to do anything alone, to do anything apart from the body of Christ. It reminds us of our utter need for God, the fact that we can't exist without him. And when united to the cross and resurrection of Jesus, the anxiety that we experience, the fear that we experience, it can be and it will be redeemed. I'm living proof of that. I've had moments in my life where I didn't know that I could breathe another day. And yet Jesus has used all of that to show me his love for me, his goodness in my life, and the fact that I am exactly who he calls me to be and has made me to be. So in general, I also want to make the point that anxiety is not a reason that Jesus might not be calling you to give your life to him. It may be more that he's calling you deeper into trust so that he can transform you and so that you can make a greater gift of yourself to him, whether that be perhaps in religious life, whether that be as a single person, maybe as a married person. Um, everything that we experience can be redeemed by God, including the anxieties that face us, whether it be every day uh, every month, every week, every year, whatever it is for you, whatever your experience is with you. When you experience it, you can almost even just say to yourself, like, you know what, this is a gift. Thank you, God, for giving me a moment of encounter with you that can be so transformative that your love can enter into and take this junk that um, seems to be a mess and a wound of sin, uh, but with your grace is transformed into a font of mercy and love and peace so that you can experience that peace and then share that with all those you come into contact with. And so I'd just like to take one minute to offer you a blessing um, that as you go from this virtual retreat and into whatever discernment, whatever you've got going on in life, um, that you can make decisions with great peace, with great joy, with great love, because you know that you are in the moment, in that present moment with God the Father who cares for you deeply. And so, Father, I ask you to bless uh, my sisters who are joining us here today. I ask you to fill them with your love, with your peace, with your consolation. Um, I ask you to give them, especially the Spirit's gift of discernment, the gift of 
an opportunity of self-gift with total abandonment um, so that they can know that even in the midst of their sin, in the midst of their brokenness, in the midst of their feelings of not being good enough, that you make them enough, that your mercy makes them who you are calling them to be. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you. Know you're in my prayers. And uh, perhaps we'll run into each other one day. Take care.